It is glorious, this history of ours. It is a great story, that of the Negro in America. It begins way before America was America, or the USA, the USA. It covers a wide span, our story. Let me tell it to you. Hear the wind in the sails of the ships of Columbus? They say one of his pilots, Pedro Alonso Nino, was a Negro. That was in 1492. Certainly by the early 1500s, black explorers were coming to the New World. One of them was Esteban, or Estebanico, his nickname, which means in Spanish, Kid Steve. Tierra! Ahí está Tierra! From the deck of a Spanish galleon, he cried, Land! There is land! When he first sighted the coast of what is now Florida, on that coast, his ship was wrecked, and Esteban, with four Spaniards, were the only men left alive. Perhaps because he was colored, Esteban got along well with the Indians. He learned their various languages and soon became a famous guide and translator for other explorers who could not communicate with the Indians. All the way across the southern part of what is now the United States and as far as Mexico City, for eight years Esteban wandered. From Mexico, in 1539, he set out with Friar Marcos de Niza on an expedition toward the north to find the fabled seven cities of Cibola, which were said to be built of gold. Esteban was the only Negro in the group. The Spaniards held out until they got as far as what is now Texas. Then the heat and the dust overcame them. They asked Esteban if he would go ahead with the Indian guides and send word back to them as to what he found. Esteban did not find the cities of gold, but he did find rich Indian pueblos with houses of sun-baked brick whose doorways were decorated with turquoise. And he discovered the rich and beautiful country of gold, cotton, copper, and flowers that is now Arizona. So you see, the first Negroes did not come to America as slaves. They came as explorers. History says that when Balboa discovered the Pacific, 30 colored men were in his party. 1619 was the year when the roots of slavery began in Virginia, and ships filled with captured black men and women began to sail across the Western Ocean to our shores. In chains, crowded in the dark holes of the slave ships, they sang their mournful songs. <laughs> Sometimes whole groups of Africans taken on deck at night for air would leap into the sea, committing mass suicide rather than go into slavery. As soon as they were landed and sold, some would run away into the forest and join the Indians. No man wanted to be a slave, but thousands of Africans were brought by force to America to plant cotton, rice, corn, and wheat, to build the roads and clear the forest, to do almost all the hard work that went into the early building of America. Most slave masters were heartless and cruel, but there were some who were kind. Such a master was the tailor, John Wheatley. One day he went down to the dockside in Boston to buy from a newly arrived slave ship a little servant girl for his wife. The child he bought was from Senegal, maybe seven or eight years old, very dark and cute and shy and frightened too, for she could not speak a word of English. Nobody knew her name, and she could not understand people when they asked her what her name was. So her master and mistress called her Phyllis. Later, she took their last name, Wheatley. Before she was 20, that name, Phyllis Wheatley, began to be famous all over the New England colonies, for she became a poet. General George Washington wrote Phyllis a letter commending her talent. Because of her genius, Phyllis was given her freedom. But in a land of slavery, when Phyllis wrote one of her famous poems about the freedom of the American colonies after the Revolutionary War, she must have been looking forward to the future freedom of her own people too. This is a part of her poem, Liberty and Peace, 1784. Lo, freedom comes, the prescient muse foretold. All eyes the accomplished prophecy behold. Her port describe, she moves divinely fair. Olive and laurel bind her golden hair. 
To every realm shall peace her charms display, and heavenly freedom spread her golden ray. The first man to fall for American freedom was a Negro, Crispus Attucks. When a group of Bostonians who did not like being ruled by the king protested and the Redcoats fired, Crispus Attucks was shot dead. Today, in Boston Common, there is a monument to Attucks, the Negro who died for American freedom. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. In 1783, America became a free nation, the USA. That is, all were free except the Negro, still a slave, but not willing. No man likes to be a slave. In 1800, a young Negro, Gabriel, organized a revolt in Virginia that involved thousands of black men and women. But on the day when the uprising must have started, a great storm and a flood wrecked their plans. The leaders were discovered, and Gabriel and some 35 others were put to death by the slave owners. They died silently. In 1831, another great slave rebellion broke out in Virginia, led by Nat Turner. In this one, some 60 slave owners were killed. More than 100 Negroes lost their lives before this uprising was suppressed. 17 slaves were put to trial and hanged but Nat Turner had no regrets. Just before he was led to the scaffold to die, he said, I was intended for some great purpose. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. More and more restless did those in bondage become. More and more did they revolt. In increasing numbers, too, they were escaping to the north. One who had been a slave but went away to freedom was a woman named Isabella. In New York City, she had a vision. So she changed her name to Sojourner Truth, and she began to make speeches all over the north against slavery. Now about my name, the Lord gave me Sojourner because I was to travel up and down the land, showing the people their sins and being a sign unto them. And afterwards, I told the Lord I wanted another name because everybody else had two names. And the Lord gave me truth because I was to declare the truth to the people. I've had five children, and I've seen them most all sold off into slavery. And when I cried with the mother's grief, None but Jesus hears. Where they be, I don't know. And my children don't know where I be. But I look at the stars, and they look at the stars, and somehow I feels better. Now I walks the world looking for truth. I think of the great things of God, not the little things. I as a sojourner looking for truth. Truth to her was freedom, not just for herself, but for all. That's what it meant to Harriet Tubman, too, in the dark, in the deep woods, singing. Steal away, steal away, steal away to But that steal away did not mean, as the slave masters thought, 
stealing away to Jesus. Harriet Tubman used that song as a great secret call to steal away to freedom, to steal away through the swamp and follow the North Star to freedom. After she had made her own escape alone from a Maryland plantation, Harriet Tubman went back into slave territory many times to rescue relatives and friends and guide them to the North. My Lord, he calls me, he calls me by the thunder, the trumpet sounds within my soul, I got long to say. Chillin', but where freedom is. The house can never be so nice with a soft bed and fine food and fire in the fireplace, but it ain't home if it ain't where freedom is. Houseboy, I hear you crying in the big house where you eat the missus cake. <laughs> freedom ain't there. Coachman, I hear you crying on the carriage seat where you drive them fine bays. Freedom ain't there. Rosie, I hear you crying as the master slips a coin in your hand when the mistress ain't looking because you's pretty. Money ain't freedom. I live where the fire's out, where the bed is hard, and the bread is scarce, and maybe you work, and maybe you eat, and maybe you don't. The North. But freedom is there. Do you want to go? I know you do, because freedom is where I'm going. Come with me through swamp, through mire, past paddle rollers with their bloodhounds and dogs, past danger, past even death. Freedom is there. Come with me. Come see. Swing low, sweet chariot. Come and for to carry me think she was singing about the chariot of death? Not Harriet Tubman. Called at one time the most dangerous woman in America, with a price of $40,000 on her head, put up by the slave owners for her capture, going back and forth in the South to rescue slaves, a great conductor of the Underground Railroad to freedom, a nurse for the Union soldiers in the Civil War, a spy for the Union armies, Harriet Tubman was singing about the chariot of freedom. But not all slaves had a Harriet Tubman to help them escape from slavery. Thousands ran away alone. This is a song about a slave named Riley who escaped like a turkey through the corn and about a bloodhound named Radler who could not pick up his scent. Riley walked in water, here Rattler, yeah. Oh, Riley walked in water, here Rattler, yeah. Rattler's gone like a turkey through the cone, here Rattler, yeah. Oh, Riley's gone like a turkey through the cone, here Rattler, yeah. Oh, 
rattler, come when I blow my horn. Yeah, rattler, yeah. Old rattler, come when I blow my horn. Yeah, rattler, yeah. Toot, toot, toot. Yeah, rattler, yeah. Toot, toot, toot. Yeah, rattler, yeah. But there's no use calling rattler, master. Old Riley's gone. Long gone. North. What was slavery like that men rebelled against it, women risked their lives to escape, that upset the whole South and eventually brought war to the nation? Once when I was trying to clean the house like old Miss tell me, I finds a biscuit and I was so hungry I ate it because we never ceased to think it's a biscuit. We just have cornbread and syrup, but, but when I ate that biscuit and she comes in and say, Where's that biscuit? I said, Miss, I, I ate it because I was so hungry. Then she grabbed that broom and starts to beat me over the head with it and calling me low down. I guess I, I just clean lost my head because I knowed better than to fight her if I knowed anything at all, but I start to fight her. And the driver, he comes in and he grabs me and he starts beating me with that cat of nine tails and he beats me till I fall to the floor nearly dead. He cut my back all to pieces. When a slave died, they buried him the same day. They cut him down to the graveyard on the place and didn't even let you bury him deep enough so that buzzards wouldn't come circling around looking for their bodies. In them days, there weren't no time for moaning. My papa was strong. He never had a licking in his life. But one day the master says, Si, you gotta have a whooping. And my papa says, I never had a whooping and you can't whoop me. And the master says, but I can kill you. And he shot my papa down. My mama took him in the cap and, and put him on a pallet. And he died. Frederick Douglass, in his autobiography, describes a beating which a Maryland slave breaker gave him when he was a boy in order to tame him for his master, who wanted his spirit broken. He rushed at me, tore off the few clothes I had on, and proceeded to wear out on my back the heavy gourds he had cut from a gum tree. Under his blows, my blood flowed freely. Whales were left on my back as large as my little finger. During the first six months I was there, I was whipped either with sticks or cowskins every week. So no wonder Frederick Douglass said to himself, I'll run away. I have only one life to lose. It cannot be I shall live and die a slave. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Douglas was 21 when he ran away. He got a job in New England, began to make anti-slavery speeches, and eventually became one of the great American abolitionists, founding a paper called the North Star, writing and speaking for freedom. Strong societies of white abolitionists, including people of every faith, grew up in the northern cities. Many escaped slaves worked with the white abolitionists. Some limited their activities to speaking and writing and fundraising in the North, while others, like Harriet Tubman, risk their lives to go into the South to help slaves escape. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people And 
then there came a kind of Moses intending to lead the slaves to freedom. His name was John Brown. John Brown, old and tall, white, with a flowing white beard, a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other. John Brown believed that God had called him to help free the Negro people. In a speech on the 4th of July, 1852, Frederick Douglass said, It is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. John Brown brought the thunder and the earthquake. A group of white men and Negroes together, 23 in number, one October night in 1859, marched on the government arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, intending to seize the arms and give them to the slaves. Some were killed and the rest were taken prisoners. John Brown's uprising was a failure in so far as freeing the slaves then went, but it shook the empire of slavery to its foundations. It startled the world. It aroused the conscience of the nation. It gave courage to the bondsmen and struck terror into their masters. John Brown was hanged, but it was only a matter of time before the whole of the Union armies began to march for freedom. John Brown died on the scaffold, but his soul went marching on in song and story. John Brown died that the slave might be free. John Brown died that the slave might be free. John Brown died that the slave might be free, but his soul goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His soul goes marching on. Thousands believe that Brown was right and slavery was wrong, that Frederick Douglass was right and slavery wrong, Harriet Tubman was right to steal slaves away from their masters, and the masters were wrong. Then Abraham Lincoln became president. Julia Ward Howe wrote a song. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his soul is marching on. And armies of men began to march for freedom. Frederick Douglass called for Negro volunteers in aid of Lincoln. Go, go quickly and help fill up the first colored regiments from the north. Remember Denmark Beasy of Charleston. Remember Nat Turner. Remember John Brown. Frederick Douglass sent his own two sons to war against the slave masters. Harriet Tubman became a nurse in the Union armies and later a spy behind the rebel lines. Colonel Robert Gould Shaw led the Negro troops at the assault of Fort Wagner, and the cannon boomed. But when the camps were quiet in the lull between battles, through the darkness of night, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the lord he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored he has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword his troop is marching on glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah his truth is marching on and in the negro slave cabins Sometimes, even before freedom came, the song came. And in the ranks of the Union armies, from tents pitched on a ridge in the starlit night, John Brown's body lies in holding in the clay. John Brown's body lies molding in the clay. And the truth goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. 
hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And the truth is marching on. And then, after many men had died on the battlefield, the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, put his name to a paper that said, On the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And the truth is mighty known. last in the dooryard bloomed, and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night, I mourn, and yet shall mourn, with ever-returning spring. Ever-returning spring. Trinity sure to me you bring lilac blooming perennial, and drooping star in the west, and thought of him I love. O powerful western fallen star, O shades of night, O oh, moody, tearful night, O oh, great star disappeared. So wrote Walt Whitman on the death of Abraham Lincoln, killed in Washington, a martyr to our freedom. The Civil War was over, Lincoln was dead, emancipation had begun, and the period historians call the Reconstruction. For a little while, freedom was wonderful. There were Negro representatives from the South in Congress. Negroes held city and state offices. Then the reaction set in. The vote was taken away from the freedmen in many states. The Ku Klux Klan began to ride. Jim Crow cars made their appearance on the railroads. Negro churches and schools were burned. White teachers were driven away from the South. Freed with nothing. The farmer's slaves were poor and often hungry. The night was dark. But hope was there, and ambition, and the desire for learning, even though the road was hard. Thank you.
the blues. But the sun is going to shine in my back door someday. Shortly before the Civil War began, a boy was born in slavery. He stood one day with bare feet before the big house to hear the Emancipation Proclamation read. And he saw the tears run down his mother's face at the news of freedom. Then, still a child, he went to work in the salt pits of West Virginia. He wanted to learn to read and write, but so did his mother. But there was no teacher for Negroes anywhere around. So all by themselves they poured over an old blue-backed speller at night by the fireplace. Finally, the colored people of the town raised enough money to send away and get themselves a teacher. Then the boy went to school, working in the early mornings before school in the salt mines and again after school until dark came. On his first day in class, the teacher asked all the children their names, and each child but him had two names. He was ashamed to have only one name, Booker. So when his turn came, out of the clear blue sky, he added Washington. Booker Washington, he said. Later, he added an initial, T. He gave himself a full name, Booker T. Washington. When he was about 15, Booker walked almost all the way to Hampton on the coast to study, arriving there with no money. But the kind white teachers accepted him, and he became their most famous student. After graduation, he himself founded a school, Tuskegee, and he became one of the great American Negroes, an educator and a diplomat, a kind of link between the freedmen and the powers that be, a counselor to presidents and the official leader of his race. At the Cotton State Exposition in Atlanta in 1895, addressing the largest crowd to whom a Negro had ever spoken in the United States, Booker T. Washington made a famous speech that went in part like this. One third of the population of the South is of the Negro race. No enterprise seeking the material, civil or moral welfare of this section can disregard this element of our population and reach the highest success. Once a ship lost at sea for many days, suddenly sighted a friendly vessel. From the mast of the unfortunate vessel was seen a signal. Water, water, we die of thirst. The answer from the friendly vessel came back. Cast down your bucket where you are. A second time the signal, water, water, send us water, ran up the distressed vessel and was answered, cast down your bucket where you are. The captain of the distressed vessel, at last heeding the injunction, cast down his bucket, and it came up full of fresh, sparkling water from the Amazon River. To those of my race who underestimate the importance of cultivating friendly relations with a southern white man, who is their next door neighbor, I would say, cast down your bucket where you are. Cast it down in making friends in every manly way of the people of all races by whom we are surrounded. Cast it down in agriculture, mechanics, in commerce, in domestic service and in the professions. No race can prosper till it learns there is as much dignity in tilling a field as in writing a poem. To those of the white race, I would repeat what I say to my own race. Cast down your bucket where you are. Cast it down among the eight millions of Negroes whose habits you know, whose fidelity you have tested. Cast down your bucket among these people who have tilled your fields, cleared your forests, and brought forth treasures from the bowels of the earth. Cast down your bucket among my people. Help and encourage them to the education of head, hand, and heart. There is no defense or security for any of us except in the highest intelligence and development of all. This will bring to our beloved South a new heaven and a new earth. Tuskegee became a model industrial school. 
Educators came from all over the world to study its methods of teaching people how to let down their buckets where they are, getting the most out of the soil and surroundings they live in. To Tuskegee, Booker T. Washington brought a young agricultural chemist, George Washington Carver, who was to become just as famous as the founder of the school. Carver developed hundreds of new products from the peanut, the sweet potato, and the soil of Alabama itself, from paints to cooking oils, plastics to rubber compounds, peanut butter to linoleum. His discoveries enriched the whole South, indeed the whole world, not just the Negro people. While Washington and Carver were working at Tuskegee, other Negroes all over the country were doing important things too. Great Negro newspapers were being founded, colored insurance companies were coming into being, books were being written, and among other things, Jazz was on its way to being born. Dayton, Ohio, a colored elevator boy was writing poetry. His father and mother had been slaves, and it was young Paul Lawrence Dunbar, as a child in school, who helped his mother learn to read and write. Dunbar grew up to publish many books, to lecture in England, and to write Broadway shows. One of Dunbar's poems, famous at the turn of the century, is about a father coming home from a long day's work playfully picking up his baby son and saying, Little brown baby with sparkling eyes, come to you, pappy, and sit on his knee. What you been doing, sir? Making sand pies? Look at that bib. You's as dirty as me. Look at that mouth. That's molasses, I bet. Come here, Mariah, and wipe off his hands. Bee's going to catch you and eat you up yet, being so sticky and sweet. Goodness land. Little brown baby with sparkling eyes. Who's pappy's darling and who's pappy's child? Who is it all the day never once tries for to be cross or once loses that smile? Where did you get them teeth? My, you's a scam. Where did that dimple come from in your chin? Pappy don't know you. I believe you's a tramp. Mammy, this here's some old straggler got in. Let's throw him out the door on the sand. We don't want no straggler laying around here. Let's give him away to the big booger man. I know he's hiding around here right near. Booger man, booger man, come in the door. Here's a bad boy you can have for to eat. Mammy and Pappy don't want him no more. Swallow him down from his head to his feet. There, there now. I thought that you'd hug me up close. Go back, old booger. You shouldn't have this boy. He ain't no tramp nor no straggler, of course. He's Pappy's partner and playmate and joy. Come to your palace now. Go to your rest. Wish you could always know ease and clear skies. Wish you could stay just a child on my breast. Little brown baby with sparkling eyes. Down in New Orleans, a little brown boy in the band at the Waif's home began to play on a battered old cornet the music that he had always heard. This lad played so beautifully that the people stopped on the streets to stand at the curb whenever his band passed. Later, this boy from New Orleans became one of the great kings of jazz, Louis Armstrong. <laughs> ¶¶ 
that's Louis, and he's playing a blues. The blues that were to have such a great influence on American life. In 1914, W.C. Handy wrote the St. Louis Blues, now sung around the world. And in 1924, George Gershwin first performed his Rhapsody in Blue that has become an American classic. Its themes are derived from the Negro blues. The blues are sad songs, but with an undercurrent of hope and determination in them. Thus it was with Negro life for a long time, with pools of prejudice and segregation at the doorstep, but with hope and determination always there. In 1905, a group of courageous colored men met at Niagara Falls to initiate a movement to do something about the many problems which colored people and democracy faced. Out of their conference eventually grew the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Together, white liberals, Negro liberals, through the NAACP, began to try to bring into being full democracy for all of the people in our land. In 1915, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, to whom this recording is dedicated, established the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Later, he founded Negro History Week. This association soon began to publish the Journal of Negro History and the Negro History Bulletin. Also, they published Dr. Woodson's book, The Negro in Our History. They brought out many other valuable records of our past and our present. Following the First World War, there were 70 lynchings within a year. In 1919, there were 25 bloody raised riots in the United States. In some towns, returning Negro soldiers were beaten and forced to discard their uniforms. Mobs burned Negro homes. Segregation grew. In the violent Chicago race riot, millions of dollars worth of property was destroyed and many people killed. It was then that the poet Claude McKay wrote his most famous sonnet. If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while around us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. So far outnumbered, let us show us brave. And for their thousand blows, deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men will face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. But for civilized men, violence should be no solution for their problems. So the NEACP kept working for equal enforcement of the laws of our Constitution, particularly for the colored citizen who did not have legal equality or full protection by the police. But little by little, we have seen these objectives come more and more into being in recent years, largely through the affirmation of the Supreme Court's upholding of the great provisions of our Constitution. In those states where Negro tax money was spent for beautiful state universities to which Negroes could not go, the lawyers for the NAACP convinced the Supreme Court that this should not be, and the court declared it wrong. Again, through the NAACP, restrictive covenants denying colored people the right to buy homes anywhere were broken down. Segregation in interstate travel has been declared against the national interest. And, most recently, the right of all children to a full and equal education without discrimination has been upheld. Another organization of Americans of both races, the National Urban League. The Urban League has had great effect in opening up to Negro workers employment in plants, in factories, and offices, and shops where formerly no colored people worked. The large National Association of Colored Women's Clubs under the guidance for many years of Mary McLeod Bethune, 
has been a force for good in race relations too. During the Second World War, Mrs. Bethune became an advisor to the president and an internationally known speaker for the rights of all peoples. Meanwhile, books by Negro writers began to be published in increasing numbers and to be translated abroad. Our music, from jazz to the symphonies of William Grant Still, has been heard around the world. And Joe Lewis became the heavyweight champion of the world. Jackie Robinson became a member of the Dodgers. And our music is still traveling. Here is Ella Fitzgerald. Now all the children tag along just to listen to his song. Monkey dancing on a string to the organ grinder swing. Hi ho! Hi ho! Hi ho! Hi ho! Why swing it so do you? In the United Nations, the highest ranking American official on the permanent staff is Dr. Ralph Bunch, a Negro, second only to the Secretary General. Born in Detroit, educated in California and at Harvard University, Ralph Bunch is an expert on the affairs of minority groups and smaller nations. He was the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950. Looking at the years ahead of us, Dr. Bunch says, I have great faith that the kind of world we all long for can and will be achieved. It is the kind of world the United Nations is working incessantly to bring about, a world at peace, a world in which people practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors, a world in which there is full respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion, a world in which all men shall walk together as equals and with dignity. Ralph Bunch is speaking for all mankind, but in speaking for mankind, he is speaking for the Negro in America too. We have wanted those very things since the beginnings of our history in the United States. Our efforts to achieve them and our very great achievements make up the story of, indeed, the glory of Negro history in America. All the way from the Negro pilot who was with Columbus to Ralph Bunch at the United Nations, from Estevan and the explorers with Balboa, to Hanson who went to the North Pole with Perry, from the colonial poet Phyllis Wheatley, dozens of other excellent colored writers, from Crispus Attucks, the first man to fall for American independence, to Dory Miller, hero of World War II, from the anonymous Negro singers on the slave ships to Marian Anderson, from the players of African drums to Duke Ellington and the hundreds of famous makers of music today, from Harriet Tubman to Mary McLeod Bethune, who speaks to us now in her own voice. We have known what it is to suffer. We are prepared to understand suffering. We have known what it is to be underprivileged. We are prepared by history to redeem others from want. For years I have felt that despite the difficulties and obstacles in the way, our great American nation was moving toward integration and solidarity. I have always believed that someday we would find greater peace and harmony among the many elements which make up the American people. There is now before us an unparalleled opportunity. This is our day. Doors will open everywhere. The flood tide of a new life is coming in. Oh.